Hello, everyone. My name is Dirk Pauling, Chairman of the European PropTech Association. Uh, with me is Professor Rudy Arnold. He's a senior economist, chief economist team of the European Commission. Me being in Paris, he being in uh, Brussels, we're going to try to bring you um, 40 minutes of a lot of information. First of all, let me thank uh, the team of uh, Propel by MIPIM for having us here today and opening the second day of a uh, wonderful two days uh, concentrated on PropTech. So I want to start with by, by telling everyone why PropTech is a priority for Europe and also for the European Commission. Well, we have macroeconomic trends that put a pressure on returns and efficiency. Data technology that will drive, that are driving new needs of end users and real estate, which is a market of 217 trillion and still largely undigitized. And then the most important thing when we talk about European Commission is, of course, the, uh, the EU Green Deal, because it will have and has already uh, an enormous impact on uh, the evolution of property. Now, when we look at what's happening in Europe, and also on a global scale, we see specifically that we have two trends that are impacting real estate. We have global trends, which are more the macroeconomic trends, uh, climate change, aging of, uh, aging of the population, um, and also the rise of urban uh, population and the more complex um, projects that are being done. And the second trend is the technologies that are impacting real estate. Uh, I'm talking there about AI, the, the BIM, but also the IoT, big data, uh, robotics, blockchain, we will, talking, we will be talking about that. So all of this, is, is this moment has an enormous influence specifically uh, on the real estate also in, in Europe. Um, and when we look at, at the drivers of innovation in real estate, there's two major drivers. There's user experience and efficiency. And when we then look at the four <coughs> technologies that will be uh, very important in, in the next uh, five years, uh, specifically for European real estate and, and PropTech. Uh, it's blockchain, uh, it, it's of course 5G, it's AI, IoT, VR, AR. Why? Like blockchain is bringing us transparency and financial stability and helps us in efficiency with transactions and valuations. We have 5G workspaces, workspaces that will be connected workspaces. Uh, AI lets us hyper-personalize the, the offers and is, of course, engaging in uh, democratization of data technology and um, intelligence. So in Europe, we need to prepare for the future. Um, and let's look at how we are doing here in Europe. Well, first of all, you need to know that 87% <laughs> Of, uh, of companies have said that they will increase spending on protect solutions within the 12 next months, which is a good sign. But only 58% of real estate corporates have a real digital strategy. They have already hired the people, but not yet uh, developed a real strategy. So why are people, why are the large corporates turning to, uh, to protect solutions? Well, first of all, it's because they seek improved efficiency. 65% of respondents. Uh, Others seek more the cost reduction, which is like 47%. Uh, percent. And then the most important question, what is holding back innovation? What, what is holding us back in Europe? Well, first of all, the major thing is that a lot of comp uh, corporates do not understand or do not see uh, the ROI. 46% has difficulties in detecting, within all the PropTech solutions that we have in Europe, detecting the ROI. Others tell us that they have other strategies. Uh, 40% also very uh, important. Um, when we look at how Europe is driving innovation, I'm very pleased to present uh, something really, really unique in the world, by the way, to, to you. And that is the collaboration between European Public Association and the European Space Agency. You would like to think, what is the European Space Agency doing uh, in PropTech? Well, this agency has launched a specific PropTech kickstart program, which means that they will make available to the best PropTechs in Europe technologies that have been developed within the framework of the European Space Agency. So they are not only giving money, like they're giving grants, like funding, um, to the PropTech startups in Europe, to the selected ones at least, um, but they also will give them support. So how, do, how would this look like? Um, what, what could be the implementation? So. The European Space Agency, uh, as far as technologies, is specifically um, things like the global uh, navigation satellite systems, but also Earth observations or communications. And the applications that we could use from the European Space Agency um, is, for example, the positioning of uh, information of users navigating uh, uh, augmented reality applications, but also searches, searches for uh, real estate uh, assets or 
monitoring of construction activity. So all of these things, the, the European Space Agency will be uh, helping Proptex to develop this further or to integrate these technologies into their existing solutions. So I'm calling upon all the European Proptex uh, today, which are about 2,700, um, to look at the domains where they will be doing this call, uh, the European Space Agency then. It's sharing economy, investment managers and, and, and marketing, but also in insurance, urban planning and uh, contact construction uh, technology. When you see on the right side of my slide, you see that uh, I'm talking about a call. A call is what, uh, what, what is um, referred to uh, as ESA asking the property companies to submit a proposal and to ask for funding and to ask for, hey, I would like to use that technology. So you see that there are three calls. Um, we will give a handout to the people of Propel by MIPIM uh, today and, uh, and they can distribute that to the people who are interested in this. And of course, you need to follow the European Property Association because we communicate about that. So it's a really great example of how Europe is driving innovation uh, at a really top, top level and helping the, the property scene uh, to move ahead. And to prove to you that it's not just an idea, this European agency, uh, European Space Agency, uh, Proptex Kickstarter. Look at this file. When you see at the right bottom up, uh, you see that the, the, the funding uh, actually goes at this moment most, uh, in a general way of speaking, into GPS, drones, big data, data analytic, mapping, geospatial, uh, artificial intelligence, smart buildings. So it's really not a coincidence that the European Space Agency is willing to help out the Proptex startups all over Europe. But it's not, that's not all, of course, because Europe is driving innovation also with other programs. One of the programs that I want to highlight here for you today is the Fast Track to Innovation program, where you get up to 3 million euros for property startups and scale-ups, grants in 2020, um, where you have to make a consortium with other companies and then ask for money from the European Commission. So how does it work? You, as a property startup, if you want to, to, to get money for certain projects that you think this is very important, you can go to large corporates in real estate and ask them to make a consortium together with you, and then you can apply for funding in this program. Fast track to innovation. Next to that, there is the European Innovation Council with an accelerator program. It's for project startups and scale-ups. And here, it, it's single SMEs or single startups that can ask for money. It's between 0 0.5 and 2.5 million euros in a contribution, so it's in a grant, or, and because it can be combined, up to 15 million euro per scale up in equity. We will talk about that later, uh, specifically Professor Arnaud will talk about that. So what's driving the innovation also from the European Commission out is of course the, the, the Green Deal. Because the Green Deal has an impact on real estate. Real estate is responsible for about 40% of the, of, of the emissions and 44% of energy consumption. It will force companies in real estate to adopt property solutions because they will need to lower emissions and need to lower the energy consumptions. One highlight that I'm taking out of this is the renovation of the stock. I think most of people don't know that, but in Europe, we are renovating the stock of the buildings at a rate of about 0.4% to 1%. It's not enough, of course, and the Green Deal will make sure that we more than double the renovation of the existing buildings. And if you renovate an existing building, then there's money from the European Commission within the framework of the, the EU Green Deal to help you implement the property solutions that, makes your, that make your building green, let's say. So at the same time, all of this in the Green Deal is accelerating the need for property solutions. And that is why the European Commission is paying a lot of uh, attention um, to the evolution of PropTech right now throughout uh, Europe. Then, um, oh, I'm going too fast. Uh, then we have a very important new program. It's called EU Next Generation. Uh, it's a 1.85 trillion uh, budget to boost the economy in the Eurozone. One of uh, the programs that uh, Professor Arnold will talk about here uh, in a minute is Escalar. Escalar is really a financial mechanism that will double the investment, at least double or quadruple the investment in PropTech startups uh, in Europe. Why? Uh, because it will activate money from the, uh, from the pension funds uh, that will be invested in funds um, dealing with uh, investing themselves in PropTech um, solutions. So later uh, we will get back 
to that. So with the European Public Association, we are driving all these initiatives. And, and what we want to do is together with the 24 national networks, you see them here, and representing 2,700 startups and scale-ups, and with the support of about 120 large corporates in, uh, in Europe, we are here to help that European ecosystem. You can see there some of the examples and also the numbers. So we have a, a very rich um, ecosystem here in Europe. We, we can be very proud of it. Uh, we got people from all over uh, the world, all over the globe, who are m very much interested uh, in our European PropTech um, startups and scale-ups and also interested in investing in them. Now, what do we do with uh, the European PropTech Association? Well, we work together um, to standardize a fragmented uh, EU PropTech market. We are creating a legal framework within Europe, because we have a fragmented market, uh, adapted to PropTech, and uh, we are facilitating access to EU funding and, and subsidies. We have an in-house team of 15 people that helps PropTech startups and scale-ups to get access to the programs that I was talking about. Right now, from all the associations, we have more than 50 files, 50 proposals that we are now handling um, for European PropTechs. And in the end, it's also about scale-up scaling of the cross-border collaboration. It's very important. Uh, today, at the end of the day, we have here the finals of the PropTech Startup Europe um, and Scale Up Europe Awards, which, is organ which we organize and are being promoted and supported by the European Commission and the European Parliament with a lot of uh, juries. Um, so, in the end, what you see here is a stellar configuration around the European PropTech Associations, where the most important thing um, are, for example, the, the future collaboration with the several departments within the European uh, Commission. It can be DG Grow, DG Equin, DG Research uh, and Innovation, DG Climate. And this will enable us to better articulate towards the European Commission what can be done to help the PropTechs uh, here in Europe. Uh, what can we do to, uh, to get uh, support from the European Commission to better execute the Green Deal uh, for them? So, these are some examples of our jury members, which are the largest corporates in, uh, in European real estate. And then getting to uh, what is like the, the, the funding for European property, you need to know that we have about 185 billion to be deployed in property before 2025. Uh, in Europe, 2018, 1.53 billion was invested in property, and in 2019, 3.05 billion. So it has doubled in, uh, in one year uh, time. So at the same time, the number of deals is going down. So we see that the funding goes up, but the number of deals is going down, which is a sign of a start of a maturing market. So at the same time, PropTech in, in, in a general way, and especially in Europe, is still early. <coughs> and it is now where FinTech was about seven to eight years ago. Why? Because the majority of the PropTech startups has less than 500k funding. The majority has less than 10, 10 FTEs, and the majority is in the validation stage. So this is really the moment where also the European Commission and the institutions look at a sector that is about to boom. And it was already booming, of course. I'm getting back to that later. And then we have uh, a look at the, at the general trends per segment in Europe. Because we have several categories, and in these categories, um, we have finance and invest, design and build, market and transact, manage and operate, and live and work. And when you look at this slide, you see that market and transact and manage and operate are really the domains where a lot of prop tech startups and scale-ups are active. And they are less active at the bottom, live and work, or finance and invest. So there's a lot of room there for others to also go into the spaces which are less crowded, finance and invest, for example, uh, design and build, and live and work. When you see on a global level, you see that the most has been invested in commercial real estate and property firms, in firms that are linked to smart building systems, online lending marketplaces, and online investment uh, marketplaces. It's like that global, and it's also like that um, in Europe. So what's happening now in Europe for us? Uh, the prop takes well, Q1 and Q2 started strong, but the slowdown has come. Why? Why? Because the EU startups and scale-ups are, and the investors also, they are tied to the internal EU market performance. 
we have liquidity challenges, of course, and we have a lot of follow-on deals. Mm? And then, in the end, also corporate investors that are aligning their strategy with their essential business. Good news is that, and this is a very important slide, here I, pro I propose to you to look at the VC investments as a percentage of the G GDP. And so, when you look at the yellow bars, you see that it's increasing year after year. You see there also how the countries are doing. But you see that the small red lines indicate the average of VC investment as a percentage of GDP over the last four years. So let's take 2015 to 2019. So bottom line, what it says is that in almost all the countries in Europe, VC investment as a percentage of GDP has been growing steadily year on year. This bodes well for PropTech. So, positive outlook for European PropTech. The companies are improving their readiness of infrastructure. Corporates with cash, they will ev invest even more as they did before. The investors that have already invested in uh, the current uh, startups and scale-ups, they will invest even more. They will do follow-on deals because they will not let them uh, crash. And in the end, COVID-19 accelerates the exponential growth, but also the need for PropTech solutions, getting back to EU Green Deal is going to have a massive impact on European property. We just need to take the opportunity, we need to seize the opportunity um, to ask help from our institutions. That's my, my message um, here. So investment in European property will remain high, and that is for the solutions that will enable customers mm, uh, to, to act in the short term and that can deliver a, a really quick uh, implementation and a good ROI, uh, ROI yeah, for real estate companies. And then, in the end, collaboration within the same geography. I'm repeating this all the time. Uh, the alignment with the EU Green Deal is as important as alignment between all the European uh, properties uh, and have that cross-border collaboration uh, between all. In the end, before I leave the word now to uh, Professor Arnaud, um, we, have the, the, we had the Relevation Fundraising Summit, where supported by, by the European Property Association, where we detected that only 23% of investors uh, had 100% dedicated focus on property. And this is really important and positive for European property startups and scale-ups from 2020 onwards. Why? Because generalist VCs will invest more in specific property funds rather than creating their own teams and gaining in-house experience. And now, when you look at the deals by stage, we see that in this maturing property industry, 50% of the funding in Europe is at a later stage. And that's a, really pain, a real pain point in Europe because we have a real scale-up gap. And there's someone here with us who knows this very well, and that is Professor Rudy Arnaud from the European Commission, who will explain more to you about that. So he's going to share his presentation now. Welcome, Professor Arnaud. Thank you, Dirk. I hope this works. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you, Dirk, for the nice presentation. And uh, you, you explained all the measures of Europe. You know them much better than I do. So, congratulations. Um, I want to give, first of all, the context in, in, in which all these measures are developing and will develop and what is the link with property. First of all, noblesse oblige. You are in Paris. Unfortunately, I'm not in Paris because for the Belgians, it's a, a red area. So we are not allowed to go there. But let me at least quote a French guy, somebody else from Paris with some cognac. And we all know Jean Monnet, who wrote something like 45 years ago already. People only accept change when they are faced with necessity. And only recognize necessity when a crisis is upon them. Dirk was speaking about opportunities. I think we should all look at this crisis, which is a pain for us, but we should look at it as an opportunity for the sector. And if you look to PropTech, I always, and one of my favorite economists is Schumpeter, Josef Schumpeter, who was an Austrian, not an American. And he says, in fact, innovation is combination. It's about innovation, experimentation, and you destroy, you destroy the old one and introduce new equilibrium. And that's making higher standards and being possible. So it's almost written for PropTech. And if you look to the figure on the right of my slide, you see that we have all these new phenomena like artificial intelligence, 
virtual reality, internet of things, big data, blockchain. We combine them with real estate and what does it make? This melting pot becomes smart and digestible real estate. That is what PropTech is about. And if you look at Dirk said, there are almost 3,000 startups in PropTech now. So it is huge. It will become the fintech of the future. And I would say even that I think it will be more important than the fintech if you look to the figures where PropTech is now. Professor, no. can I just uh, interrupt you? Uh, I get here a, a sign that uh, you are not sharing the presentation. Um, no. can, you, can you check that? Because I know that you have some slides ready. I will start again to see if it works. Share now. Yes, now we see it. If you can click on, yes. Yes? Yeah, perfect, okay. it's good. So give me a second chance. <laughs> entrepreneurship second chance. So I said, first of all, to, to, to get not to be embarrassed, and I quoted uh, Jean Monnet um, saying the crisis is, is an opportunity. Now, if you look to PropTech, what is PropTech? And now you see the slide, look to the right. It's a combination of the new elements, Internet of Things, big data, blockchain, and the real estate coming to become something like smart and high to real estate. PropTech, as we said, 3,000 companies, it's huge. Now you can see everything that I can go on? Yes, it's perfect. Great. Um, now Schumpeter Petro always says, if you move from the old economy to the new economy, or from old companies and old business models to new, you have something which we call game changes. Now, what are the game changes today which are relevant for PropTech? The first one is krinomai, is the Greek word for crisis, means taking decisions, seeing opportunities. Yeah? So we have these new views on mobility. People say, why should I be in a traffic jam every morning, every evening? We organize, we realize it's not necessary anymore. So we think about online working, like this conference, which is partly online, partly offline. We think about co-working spaces. We think about the local dimension. We perhaps, you might think that it's not possible to touch a door when you open it for the virus. So this is all things that makes that this crisis leads to opportunities. Now, just if you think about real estate guys, real estate guys, which all of you are, you prefer bricks instead of clicks. And that's why, in fact, for real estate, we all think about we need the best place in the city. Location, location, location. That's what you find in all handbooks of real estate. Well, I think that location, location, location might become accessibility and mobility. Might become storage house instead of, or on top of uh, magazines where you can buy. So we should think about this thing. The third game changer is the green. And, and Dirk spoke about the green deal, which indeed is very important, which gives you huge potential for real estate. And the last game changer is the digital, because the digital becomes a new more normal. And then the real estate guys, there you have an enormous potential, and I would say even an unexploited potential. If you look to what we call the digital intensity index, and there you put the different sectors based on the NASA code, then you see, for instance, if you take computer, which is quite logic, 60% of the sector is fully digitalized. If you look to, and you see them in red, real estate, storage, construction, well, let's remain positive the potential is still very, very huge. So the one, the first message would be, let's use this crisis to more digitalize. Second message, and Dirk was talking about all these figures and these growing companies, and about the 3,000 startups we have, great. But we don't have the unicorns. And if you see, unicorns are almost exclusively the United States and China. Of course, this is a slide from six months ago, you see the biggest unicorn at the States was WeWork, valued at 35 billion. We all know that this valuation is now something like 8 to 10. So things change as fast, but let's be part of the movement. Let's say we want our startups to grow. If you look in America, out of 100 startups, 22 become a scale up, means a big company growing fast. In Europe, it's only 11. So I would like that next year on uh, PropTech, Maybe in Paris, I can show these slides with the big circle when I put the European Union. Thanks to all of you. And what is the main problem 
we can say is the fragmented market. No, it's not. Studies show that the problem of scale up is about money. And we all have been working a lot in Europe, in France, at regional level to find money for startups. And we need money for startups, what we call seed money, capital damassage. And then you see that the, the gap with the United States, it's between brackets only 10, 10 times. But if you look to the later states, then you see, let's say, the VC rounds, then you see that there is a difference of 34 times. So there's 34 times more money available in the United States for later scale money than it is in Europe. And so if you summarize our problems, we have, in fact, we have on financing three main issues. It's easy to find friends and family money. It's easy to find your first business angels. Once the business angel plans is doing a quite good job. But then we have the first equity gap, looking for 1 million, 2 million. Let's say too small to go to the formal venture capital fund and too big to go for a business angel. Second problem is the scale up gap where Dirk alluded to. Scale up gap, in my vision, it's about looking to 15, 20 million, a company making revenues mostly not profits yet, and that's wanting to expand. And the third problem is going on the stock exchange. So let's summarize. You have the IPO problem, initial public offering, you have the scale up gap problem, and you have the first equity gap problem. These three elements of kind of value of debt, huh? you can make a nice business plan. If you don't find the money to go on, then you are in real, real problem. And what is one of the big problems for the scale up gap? If you're looking for 15 to 20 million, well, unfortunately, I would say, you can find it, for instance, in the United States. But we have done some studies with the University of Ghent saying that the company goes where the money is and not opposite. So we should make that we have these big, big funds in Europe that can, without any problem, put a ticket of 10 to 15 million into one company. If not, we risk that a lot of those scale ups are leaving Europe. So if we invest in IPR, we invest in the seed phase, and then we are get, get big, they are moving. Yeah? Let's, let's give you the example of Skype, which you all know. Skype was looking for 150 million for the Estonian company. Skype did not find it in Europe. Like uh, the French company Cuteo, same thing, they find the money in the United States. And if you find the money in the United States, mm -hmm. well, the problem is that later, it's there where you move to do your thing. Conclusion, before we move to, to the next step. A lot of uh, companies in Europe at the scale-up phase leave Europe, 44%. Second, we should find a creative solution because there's a lot, a lot of public venture capital in the market. Look, for instance, in France, BPI is doing a very, very good job. I think they must be one of the biggest now in Europe. But of course, the whole challenge is to trigger private money because if not, there's a danger for crowding out. Crowding out means that public money drives out private money. Real estate and construction, as I showed you, are very low for the digital index, but let's be positive. There's a huge green potential for real estate. It's quasi unlimited. And if you put green together with digital, together with financing, then we have sustainable growth, and that is what we need in Europe. Then here's the crisis. You all know the figures, what happens. There might be a first hit, the second, a double hit scenario. We don't know. We are still, nobody expected that. Once you invited me to come to Mipim, that I still could not come physically. You see, for instance, we are now, the provision for France, for instance, minus 8%. But if there is a double hit scenario, it's minus 10. So it is huge. But at the same time, we might imagine that from 2021, 2022 onwards, there are new opportunities. And in order to push this recovery, and I remind you that tomorrow, uh, the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, is going to give a State of the Union. So what is going Europe going to do? Well, there has already been 550 billion, which has been invested in guarantee fund, for instance, for workers in, 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 in the crisis support. Is the, the, the next generation? It's 750 billion. It's a temporary one, and there's the next multi-annual financial framework, which is now a big amount. So altogether, we speak about 10% of the GDP. To give you an idea, the Marshall Plan. Do you know how much the Marshall Plan was in the time? It was. 1.5% of GDP. So we're speaking about huge money. And if you look, the, the, the basic thing will be green and digital. And if you look to green and digital, I gave you some examples of projects 
And I would invite each of you to say, hey, this is where I'm active myself, because most of these projects, they are one way or another linked to PropTech. And so Dirk is right. There's a huge potential for PropTech in the future. Now, we try to make your life easy. We know that in, in the commission, we don't always succeed. But one of the things that we did, and you may see all these acronyms there, all these programs are going to end by the end of 2020. So in three months time. And all these programs which exist today will be collected into one big pot, which is called Invest EU. So from 2021 onwards, all financing instruments, you have to look to Invest EU, and then you'll have them. And Invest EU will have different elements. Of course, we have will be investment bank, investment fund. We have the fancy the BPI France. We work with a lot of financial intermediates, venture capital funds, um, for instance, banks, and we'll have four windows. The four windows you see on the right, I will show you another way. The four windows are sustainable infrastructure, it's research, innovation, and digitalization. It should be digitalization, it's SMEs, it's social investments and skills. These are the four. And if you look again in PropTech, most of your projects do fit in one of the four, or even in four of them. There was a proposal from the Commission, which was on the table from the Council to do some strategic European investment. But at this stage, this is not going to be approved by the Council. So in fact, this means that the four first elements might have some more budget than foreseen, so that the fifth one, the one which is in red, will not be confirmed. But again, you see, this is now, if you have a project, the question you should do, is my project, and I'm speaking about 2021, is my project linked to infrastructure, or is it linked to research, or is it SME linked? What, what is it? And that's, in fact, then you should find the financing possibilities. I told you that scale up is a big issue. Now, if you look to COVID, um, studies show that it's ex exactly again in the Series B plus, looking for, let's say, 15 to 100 million that the cash burn will be harder to manage. So the shortage, which I showed you, which exists already at the pre-crisis, now getting worse. So again, the second equity gap will get wider, and that means that we need more investments and to push more and more. One of the big elements within, within those uh, will be the new program Escalar. Escalar exists already today, but in a pilot phase. So we have done a pilot phase in 2020, and we collected something like 80, 80 projects, meaning funds that want to come into Escalar. What does Escalar mean? It's brand new, it's very innovative, and for the VCs in the room or online, um, try to concentrate two minutes. The idea is, I have a fund, let's say a fund of 50 million. This fund is composed of private and public money. Well, on top of that, I can double my investment capacity by having quasi-equity. So this means the money that you get through Escalar will be capped in return, so it's lower return, but in case that the fund, which almost never happens, goes bankrupt, then you should pay back first those quasi-equity investors. So the idea would be, in fact, if I have a fund of 50 million, I double, it's a fund of 100 million. If I do a return of, let's say, 12, 14%, which is the average, well, half of the fund will only cost 4%, which means that the equity players will have a higher return on their funds. I know it's complicated, but it's hard to work. And that's why we want to attract private investors, risk averse, where we guarantee the money, and this money will then flow into venture capital funds. And this is the idea to make funds bigger. So this really focused on scale-up mm -hmm. and on big funds. Huh? To make it easy, you have asset side to investees, which are in that case only scaled up companies. So it's not about seeds, it's not about capital damage because we have rocks already in seeds and we did spoke about some instruments. We have a lot of instruments there which are going to go on after 2021. And so we have equity, which might include the European Investment Fund, which might include BPE France. And on top of that, you can have as a fund quasi equity, which give you not only a leverage in volume, the volume will double or might double, but the return of the equity players, the two on my slide, will have a leverage on the return, which means that if you set up a fund and you first got an escalar stamp, it might be much easier 
to attract equity players because you can give them perspective of a very good return. So this could be an example of how you, you compose your fund. And so the whole idea behind is to cope with the scale-up gap and to have big funds that are able to put, let's say, 10, 15, 20 million into one company that is growing fast. For those who are a bit technical, I know how the, the, the PCO, PCO works. There you see, in fact, the fund return without Escalar is the yellow one. And if you do that, you will see if you have a nice return, that Escalar will be capped and just up to 5%, which makes that the return for the LPs will be much higher. I want to finish with some final reflections on, on the on the prop tech in the prop tech world. First of all, the world is moving. So I really think that location is no longer the issue. Of course, it's still an issue, but now it's, it's time, it's accessibility and it's speed. Huh? So I think that the old storage houses you find uh, uh, at the cities, uh, uh, they might be a good potential to invest, a good potential for the future prop tech. The green deal is of course a unique opportunity. Um, it should be approved very soon. It should be operational from 2021 onwards. That's in a couple of months, so don't miss that opportunity. Digitalization, you've seen the potential is still high. For a prop tech, it has no boundaries, so we should be the first in Europe. We should try to set the references. Uh, for the scale up, it's high on the political agenda. It was on the first state of union of Ursula von der Leyen saying we want to find a scale up. We did something with Escalar. Escalar could be a very big program from next year onwards. So if you have ideas, please submit your projects. And real estate, of course, at the end of the two priorities we have today in Europe, it's green and digital. And Corona, I think, does not change, or does not alter, but it accelerates this tendency. So I would say, don't miss the momentum of a crisis because this is really a unique opportunity. Thank you very much for your attention. And sorry not to be with you. I hope next time I might be with you again. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Arnold. Uh, maybe you, there was something really interesting I was asked yesterday. I'm going to ask the question to you. Um, for a lot of people, it, it seems that Green Deal uh, equals uh, something which is not bringing profits. And so, uh, and, and this is uh, something that I know you, you spoke about uh, at another uh, occasion earlier. Uh, maybe it could be good for you to elaborate that for, for the public. Yes, yeah, because it's a very good question then, because we, we always think, uh, and in some cases, especially saying, on the one hand, you have green ecology, on the other hand, you have economy. I think this is, we should, we should get rid of this uh, dual way of thinking. Economy might become green. A green economy is something that has a high return on investments. If you take a country like Denmark, for instance, they, they focus on green economy, it's an economy that makes a return. If you see on different companies, they invest in green, but as investing in green, they make a very interesting investment. So the whole idea of green, of green deal is not to push companies to lose money and to make costs to become green, it's to use green as part of the economy. And the whole idea is what I call a positive ecology. Ecology is not about taxation, it's about rentability. And indeed, I think we should have some nice examples. Uh, for instance, there's, a, there's a, a plant, a car plant, which I know they, they invest in a roof, and that roof is depolluating while the plant is working. Well, it's an investment which has been uh, amortized in three years' time, and which is a very rentable investment. So I think we all have to be very creative and stop thinking, on the one hand, there's economy, on the other hand, there's ecology. No, there is something as positive ecology, meaning ecology or green economy that is positive for every each of the company. And I think uh, at, at the end, the question will not be, shall we become green? The question is when and how. And so again, today I would invite everybody to, to think about how to invest in a positive way in ecology, at the same time having a positive impact. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, second question that was uh, that I was asked yesterday also, uh, it's the European Space Agency and what, what we do now uh, in, in PropTech uh, with them. One of your two domains is, you to your two domains is finance and space, right? Yeah. Within uh, uh, the department that, uh, that you have under your control. Um, so, what is, what is your view on this brand new thing between European Space Agency and European PropTech? 
Well, the future, I would, I would say it in, in a kind of what you call a buddhada in French. Eh? The future of space is non-space. What do you mean by that? In space, you invested quite a lot. Eh? Sometimes Europeans are very modest. Eh? We have the biggest and more pre most precise observation capacity in the world with companions. We have it. Eh? Galileo is much more efficient than GPS. So we, we invested in space. We invested huge amount in space uh, with ESA, but as well with, with the, the National Space Agency. And we have the big one in France. We invested together. Now this infrastructure is there. So now we want to do, we have to, between brackets, rentabilize this infrastructure. Eh? We calculated that one euro invested in space would lead to eight to 12 impact on society. Means that one would have an impact from eight to 12. But what is this impact? The impact is the applications of space into non-space. Eh? For instance, precision agriculture. We can do precision agriculture thanks to the satellites. Well, PropTech is exactly the same. What we have to do now, we have to explore all sectors and see what applications we might have from space. So again, I think in PropTech, it might be very interesting to see how all different applications will go. And that's in fact what ESA has to do now. They have to finance and to look for projects where the space infrastructure is utilized in different non-space sectors. Because again, Future of space is not space. And then the, the, the last question uh, that, that uh, we have uh, coming in right now uh, is what, how the European Commission um, is looking at PropTech um, and that compared to uh, the way you were looking at, at FinTech, uh, let's say seven to eight years ago, because finance is your other domain uh, next to space, of course. Indeed, indeed. I'm a simple economist, so indeed, finance and space are or my two dadas, as they call it, so it's, it's important to see. And, and FinTech, you know, I, I, as I showed in the beginning of my slides, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Schumpeter. Some Americans say Schumpeter is American, no, he's European. And Schumpeter, he, he has a very simple story. He says innovation is combination. FinTech is finance technology. PropTech is property technology. And, and the future is, in fact, if you look to different products which are now in the market, we are all linked to combination of two elements, two services, two products. So if I say PropTech, PropTech came a bit late, why? Huh? Because, you know, real estate guys, as I said in, in Butad again, real estate guys, it's bricks, no clicks, huh? something tangible. Well, the future of building is to make our building smart. And we all live in buildings, we all work in buildings. So buildings, it's, it's crucial. It's just like the banks of FinTech. So we can have the same wave. And if you see what's happening now, and, and let's say that the European PropTech Association, you did a great job. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that you have almost 3,000 startups in Europe on PropTech? Okay, let's say that 20% of them don't make it. Let's say that 40% try to survive. This means that you have still 40% of those companies that really can grow, that can create employment, that can set the references in their field. And that's what they should be. So that's why I really believe that the potential of PropTech is very, very high. And indeed, PropTech will not only be the FinTech of uh, seven years ago, but it might be a sector that's even more important in terms of employment, in terms of setting the standards, in terms of the future for Europe. It's really strategic. And, and that's why I, I really applaud the creation of, of this association because we have now to work together. It's not only about financing. It's not only about subsidies. It's not only about risk capital. We should now think together what are the obstacles in the market? Eh? Is the PropTech market a fragmented market or not? What can we do about it? What should be done on member state levels? What should be done on European level? So that's the beginning of this evolution. And I invite uh, Dirk, you and all your members and everybody there to just give us the ideas to see how we can use and optimize the potential of the sector. All right, that's perfect. Uh, we got 30 seconds to go. So Professor Ridi Arnold, I want to thank you again for uh, speaking uh, with us, for being also here with the team of uh, Propel by MIPIM. And I'm quite sure that we're going to be here next year. And uh, I hope that you will be able to present some new figures uh, which show a, uh, an increasing line uh, in all the investments that have been, have been done in, uh, in PropTech. So thank you very much. Thank you.
And I want to end thank uh, with uh, thanking you everyone here uh, to being present and all the viewers uh, on, the, on the live stream and of course the whole team of um, Propel by Mipim. Thank you very much.